Welcome to Unbounded, talks on growth in financial services. Hi everyone, I'm Mike Parsons and Unbounded is powered by Flowex.ai. And today we are talking to the man himself. We are talking to Iwan Jakob. That's right. He's an engineer, he's an entrepreneur, and he's on a mission to make software better. That's right. He is the CEO of none other than Flowex.ai. So get ready to dig in. We're going to talk big picture about what's going on in software, and we're going to give you a ton of clues on how you might make the most of those opportunities in this crazy, fast-changing world. So let's get ready to jump into the growth equation. E1, welcome to the show. Well, Mike, thanks for, for having me. It's uh, great to, to speak again with you. It is definitely great to have you back because since we last talked, well, to say a lot has happened, I feel like we have to kind of try and process, if you think about the huge change in tech, particularly in big tech, lots of things have been going on. Then when you flip over to AI, something that you and I talked about in our last show, oh my gosh, here we are in February of 2023 and everybody's talking about it. Who would have thought, Iwan, who would have thought that people are pre-registering for Bing? Let me remind you, Bing, things have changed very quickly. I mean, how do you think about this change of the last year? Uh, of all things. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, you know, we're, we're looking at this exponential uh, right rate pace of change. And uh, I, I think th that's what's interesting about exponential trends is that the human mind isn't actually really trained to understand exponential trends. So you can understand them rationally, but you don't feel it. So because it just, you know, lingers kind of at the bottom of the chart and then uh, you know, it takes off, right? And this is what's been happening. I mean, it's no longer than summer of last year when we were talking about AI-assisted development and, you know, and uh, every single executive that, uh, you know, in and technologists, right? Like CTO, CIO was like, oh, come on, that that's not, that's not a thing. That's just some marketing stuff. It's not happening, right? And now everybody's faced with the brutal reality of, uh, you know, chat GPT being able to write pretty good code, actually, right? Pretty good functional code. So uh, it, it's, you know, in your face, you can't ignore it anymore. Right? You, so, you know, the, the interesting thing, Iwan, is that some of the, the models that they're using at chat GPT were in fact based on papers written by guys at Google, yet it's got Google in all of a fluster. It just shows you that nobody can afford to rest on their laurels, right? Even Google has to be ready for what's next. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're looking at a couple of next years that are going to be, you know, insanely transformational for the entire industry. And uh, yeah, we I think we'd be we'd better be be ready for that. Yeah. So you've spent the last several years really getting after it. I mean, it is, you're right to call it out. Like a year ago, we talked about the role of AI. And I think what really struck me when we were preparing for this show is how crazy things had got in the world of software, not just with the AI, but how people approach tech today and what they're working with in terms of the current environment of trying to find good developers and trying to um, deal with, you know, tech debt and legacy systems. What, what is the greatest battle for people trying to build software and to build products right now? Now that we've got another vector with, uh, you know, AI powered chatbots, that's just another challenge on the CTO's desk. What, what, are, what are you seeing when you travel the world talking to folks? What are they really stuck with? What's really um, causing them sleepless nights? Well, I think it's the same symptoms, right? But but you know, much more accentuated that that we're seeing, and it's this, you know, costs of of software development and cost of IT just spiraling out of control, right? And it's again, it's a function of the kind of the same exponential trajectory that these things have been having because. We've been building this pyramid scheme of, of, you know, software engineering for 
quite a while now, right? If you look back historically, right, we used to have like a bunch of really good software engineers as civilization, I, I mean, right? Like going through really hardcore schools and and uh, and then, you know, we started addressing the, the problem of delivering software uh, with volumes, right? Like bringing on more headcount and not necessarily looking at people who can be engineers. And the problem with, with that is, you know, beyond kind of the, the philosophical, um, let's say, uh, oxymoron that, that's happening there, because software is, is fundamentally a high leverage area, and we're trying to, to, to build software using more brute force, right? Um, but what, what's been happening is that actually people like, you know, that, that were not properly prepared to be engineers have created more problems in, in software, right? So you, you bring out 100 engineers, out of which maybe you have 10 real engineers, 10 people who are actually good at building, uh, you know, enterprise systems. And then 90 people are good at writing code, but they're not really able to think in terms of architectures and, you know, enterprise complexity and, and scalability and foreseeing things. So they create problems, right? They, they actually create an, in problems in, in the code that they write. And then you end up with a piece of software and bring another thousand engineers, out of which probably 20 are, are really good engineers. So it's this pyramid scheme that, that's been happening in, 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 in particular in enterprise. And I mention enterprise because I think that's where, uh, you know, things like scalability and security, uh, you know, are mostly required, right? It, it's, it, it's and, and the level at which companies have been growing, right? It's something that technology hasn't actually foreseen mm. in in you know the 90s the 2000s so the complexity and the, the scale at which software is being used right now it's just something that you know we haven't been prepared for as as a civilization do you, do you think it's a bit like you know large enterprises have been throwing so many engineers at the problem it's it's that famous mythical man month right throw more yep. people at it the brute force as you would say that that's actually this brute force just means that if you take the law of averages, that really more and more bad code is going into the system. So invariably, the enterprise is creating a sort of a house of cards. It's all band-aids here and there. Is that a kind of a, a way to interpret what you're saying? This is the kind of the, That's the challenge? That's exactly that's exactly the image, right? And then the more bad code is going in, um, the more engineers we hire, right? And quote unquote engineers. And yes. uh, again, what, what we're learning is that very large organizations, but I, I, and I think not just very large organizations, but humankind is in general, doesn't really have a good way of measuring, you know, engineering quality, right? Software is not measured by quality. It's measured by, by quantity. It's about headcount. Mm. It's about the number of people that are, which is, you know, in all honesty, doesn't really mean anything. Right, right. right. How many lines mean, of code, these kind of concepts rather than good code. So it's just pure yeah. headcount, right? Like yeah. that, that's kind of the main metric in software. It's just headcount. And, you know, I think uh, Steve Jobs uh, was the first one that was, you know, yelling, screaming at the top of his lungs about this. It's like one good one great engineer is not worth two or three it's worth a hundred x right like an, an average engineer and i think you know by definition there's much more average engineers than than great engineers right so okay so i think what we've identified is at, at a big picture level larger organizations are throwing more engineers at the problem but what they don't realize if I really study what you say is that they get really stuck with a series of bad situations. Like if people want to understand why they have so many issues with legacy systems, why they have so much tech debt, I think it's the root cause is what you've just called out. We're throwing more and more bad code. We're committing more and more bad code into our applications. We're getting it into production 
And that just causes more and more people to be fixing rather than creating the new stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, if it was kind of unanimously accepted in the 2000, 2010, that, you know, 80%, 85% of the code being written is rework, I would say that right now, um, anywhere between 95 to 98% of the code being written is rework. So there's very little... Uh, code being written that's actually, you know, adding value. Most of the code is being written is is patchwork and, and you know, not great patchwork at that, to, to be fairly honest. <laughs> well, it, it's sort of um, your brain sort of fails to, to comprehend when you have bad fixes on top of bad fixes or bad code upon bad code, bad code to fix the bad code. And we all know that when you when you sneak in a quick Band-Aid to fix this thing, often something else on the other side breaks the unforeseen, you know. Exactly. And then, one, you know, what, what, what executives in, in banking are seeing and they're, you know, in, in banking, but also in enterprise in general, well, what they're seeing and they're incredibly frustrated is like, I'm spending all this money on, on IT on software and I don't really get, you know, like exceptional results. I was talking to the, the CEO of a, of a large financial services group in Central Europe and they're saying, well, we're present in about 10 countries and we have 4,000 people in IT and we're barely keeping up doing regulatory mandated uh, updates to, to the systems, right? There's no there's very little chance for us. And by the way, every year we need to increase that number to keep up with just doing updates and, and maintenance on the systems, right? So there, there's something inherently broken in, in, in that system. The, the right. business implication of what you're talking about means that I did, the idea that an IT department might or a tech team or engineers might think about or work on the products of the future is getting further away because actually people are becoming more devoted to bug fixing, compliance, all, all these essentially keeping the trains running is such a full-time job. No one's thinking of what's the next business to be in, what's the next product to launch. Would that be fair? Absolutely, right? And the big part of the problem is legacy systems. And again, we just have not been designing 20 years ago systems for the scale at which software is required today, right? It's, it's been dr driven by all these digital growth trends. So today, actually 80, 90% of the, of the cost in IT in a large organization go towards maintaining and updating legacy systems, right? And it's it's barely keeping up and they, they you know costs are increasing but still it's barely keeping up with with as you say keeping the trains running right so that that's in, insanely uh you know frustrating for for executives in, in the enterprise I'm, you know we're talking to another bank global bank this time they have 80,000 people in IT 80,000 people in IT right it's just you know, they have, by the way, almost 1,000 people just doing iOS development. Those numbers are, are mind-boggling because You're they right. don't have hundreds of iOS applications, right? Okay, yes. maybe they have you know, 20, but they have 1,000, almost 1,000 people just doing iOS development, right? And it's this inflation of, of headcount that, that's been happening, mm. right? And throwing more and more at the problem and, and you know, but not solving it, so let's throw more headcount. I think what's interesting is what we see at the enterprise is really reflected in different ways throughout small and medium businesses and the developer community. I want to read out something you posted recently, uh, which caused like a, an enormous amount of conversation on LinkedIn, and uh, it was... Um, a user posting to Y Combinator's Hacker News. And I'm just going to read it. And I think this really shows the other side of what's happening with software as well. So this is a post done by uh, Drafen uh, on Hacker News and obviously an engineer. And, and just let's, I'll read it uh, out and then we can discuss it. Okay, so Drafen says, I currently have 10 fully 
remote engineering jobs. So this individual is saying he's got 10 gigs. <laughs> the bar is so low, he says. Oversight is so non-existent and everyone is so forgiving for underperformance. I can coast for about four to eight weeks before a given job fires me. Currently on a $1.5 million run rate for compensation this year. And he goes on a little bit further. But this is what happens when you have too many people, Iwan. This is exactly what you're saying, that this guy, this engineer is moonlighting in 10 jobs. This is like, this is the definition of a, of an industry that's at breaking point. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, you can imagine like this guy isn't even trying, right? He does literally nothing. And then it takes like two months for, for an organization to figure out that this guy is actually doing nothing and let's, let's him go. But then there's people who kind of, you know, you know, they, they chug along and they, 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 um, you know, go with the flow and they do a bit of code and yeah, they, there's th those people, they, they stay on those jobs forever. Yeah. Right. So, um, I mean, at least this guy, I love him. He's honest. He's... But, 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 but he is on the other side of that equation of large organizations. He's probably moonlighting at 10 startups, all of whom are just throwing people at the job trying to fix with this brute force mentality i mean i think this is such a powerful and honestly it's a very frank you're almost holding the industry that you've grown up in you're you're almost holding it to account does it feel at all um awkward or uncomfortable when you look at for someone who was in math olympiads who's an engineer who's founded several companies does it how does it feel to be kind of calling your own industry out? Well, uh, again, I, I think for, for us, this, this has been a mission since, you know, almost two decades ago when we started uh, uh, the, that first company. And we started it because we wanted to fix how software is being developed, right? And uh, then we realized that actually the problem is much, you know, the rabbit hole goes much deeper, right? And... Um, <clears throat> we realized that there's need for much more systemic change, right? Not just for a company that comes and, and, you know, helps other companies do software, right? So, and this is why we started FlowX, uh, you know, and we re embedded all that thinking about how do, do you create proper software and how do you provide a systemic solution to, to this challenge that we have as a civilization? All right. Well, now we're, now we've we've painted a picture of the problem, and you're you're starting to take us towards the solution. I want to remind all of our listeners and viewers that if they want to get the show notes, the transcript, and all the links uh, from this show, head over to unbounded.flowx.ai. So, okay, Ewan, here's the big question: How do we how do we start to think about what you're saying? Is effectively let's rethink software. Um, now, before we get to all the answers, I mean, did you realize when you were creating FlowX that you were embarking on such a radical uh, question? Did you realize the can of worms? Or were you still going into the rabbit hole, as we say? Well, uh, you know, th th there was some understanding of, of what we're doing. I mean, this was our mission and this is why we, we started the company, because we wanted to fix something that was so wrong. And we had some understanding of how inefficient it is, right? But then even when you see the numbers, it doesn't really hit you as hard as when you start working with, with organizations, right? I mean, you, you look at reports that say, hey, the cost of, of bad software in the U.S. is $2.5 uh, you know, and that, that that's such a de-dimensionalized way of looking at it. Yes. Right? It's a bit abstract, trillion. isn't it? That doesn't even mean anything. What, what does 2.5 trillion mean? Nothing. Right. Right. So, <clears throat> but then I, I would say that one, one of the things that we are really, let, let's say, passionate about is, well, actually, that 2.5 trillion, that means people who are wasting their lives building things that are, you know, not useful. Right. And I think that's that's incredibly bad for them that's incredibly bad for the the you know the users of that software it's just 
you know, uh, it's it's a very different picture when when you think about it as you know waste of human intelligence and waste of, of human brain width and um, you know and waste of, of uh, you know human emotion and, and frustration and just the um, the sheer amount of, of waste that goes into that two point five trillion dollars is is unfathomable, right? And that's just the cost of bad software to to companies, right? It's interesting that you touch upon the idea that it's almost so unfulfilling for engineers. And I I would imagine it's also for the product owners and the business people to all be kind of sucked in to this system of bad software, bad code, this brute force approach. Like nobody can be happy deploying 80% of their tech budget just to keeping the legacy system lights on. Like that cannot be a good feeling right at the top, right? Because you said, well, what impact are we having? Or day to day for an engineer, you're going through cleaning up mistakes, band-aiding here just to like keep things going. At all ends of the equation, nobody's really happy. And that cost keeps increasing, right? Year after year. So it's like it's it's like it's like almost, you know this this compounding problem that demands sort of a, a radical solution. Like we don't solve this just on the edges, tinkering on the edges. It sounds like you're quite ready to be radical in how you go about solving this problem. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the, you know, people in the industry have realized for a long time something is, is broken and, and, you know, they, they're trying to fix it. But we don't, really yet have something that's a widespread like a proper uh like a proper systemic fix right we we i think we're, we're just now arriving at a completely new generation of tools that has the potential to fix that problem because if you look at, at you know large companies they're they're kind of stuck in between three main paradigms right one is they're 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 stuck and they're completely captive to solution vendors Right to solutions that are inflexible, that do not represent their business, right, and that you cannot tweak or you don't have the resources to tweak, right, to to change, to tailor, to to adapt to your business and to have those solutions reflect your business, right. So you're stuck with this kind of a one size fits all uh, blueprint or, or template. Um, and that's one category of, of organizations. Another category of organizations is is stuck with insanely high costs of, of internal IT departments, right? And homegrown technologies, and you know, uh, you know, so solutions that have some flexibility, but then are again just incredibly slow and and inefficient to to update and to to tailor, right? And, and we're all, we're all seeing the crisis of these very uh, narrowly niched languages right and uh, you know the low code kind of contributed to that uh, this idea of, of low code and then you know we tried as a civilization to bring in this generation of no code tools right which which is not a bad idea per se but the the first generation of, of no code tools that we've been seeing until now actually doesn't work in the enterprise so it works for very simple use cases right to build things that are fairly simple but in an enterprise they actually deepen the problem because you cannot get away without adjusting that right and using you know full code to to kind of tweak around and, and and create like all these workarounds to to make it work in in that specific context, and then every time you you update the platform, you have to change all the workarounds and you actually end up in a much bigger mess. And they get very very fast. They get to a spaghetti type of of approach because they don't have a, an engineering structure at the core, right? You design screen by screen, or you have like this simplistic way of representing processes, and so you, you end up with actually a much bigger mess than than initially than what you were initially when you started, right? So you see all these projects started and then abandoned, right? There they kind of have like a first release, and people are then like, "Wow, oh, I'm done with this." Yeah. So, 
I think this is where our opportunity as, as you know, not just Flowex, but really as a civilization is, right? And bringing in this new generation of tools that is, um, you know, is a hybrid, no code, full code approach, because we cannot get rid of engineers, no matter what the no code tools are saying that, yeah, we're going to, we're going to build software automatically. No, you cannot get rid of engineers, right? The, the, so, the structure, the complexity of, of enterprise is just way too high. Just to check in with you there, what you're saying, this is your first big step into like almost your first principles of the solution. Start with the combination of no code and full code together. Yeah, I, I think that's that's one one essential, quintessential, uh, if you will, um, a characteristic of this new generation of tools that you know has any capability to to actually solve the problem, right? And it's not about replacing engineering; it's about augmenting engineering, and it's about taking off the plate of engineers things that are you know easy, and then. Again, uh, philosophically speaking, it's about how do you encapsulate actually the most time-consuming, resource-consuming, and complex things in enterprise software, which are scalability and security, and how do you let people focus on functionality, right? How can you let people build things, functional things, right? Because the, the challenge is not building a functional thing. The challenge is scaling it. And how do you wrap it? in a way that that's scalable and you turn functional into into something scalable i would say that's 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 a second principle that we see as absolutely necessary to to think about right again 90 99% of the complexity in, in the enterprise is not the functional aspect or the design aspect it's actually security and, and scalability right the non functional aspects of of a solution robustness and all of that so so it sounds to me like, number one, it's about bringing together the two worlds of full code and no code. The second thing, it sounds like the elimination of repetitive uh, standardized tasks that are about, or in the past, were about managing the legacy to free up that time to go and work on real features, new products, new functionalities. Absolutely. And and providing, um, you know, a layer that encapsulates uh, security and scalability so you don't have to worry about that. And, you, you know, you can let people just focus on what are the functional things that they need to build. I think that simplifies the task by, you know, orders of magnitude, not just one order of magnitude. Right. And then <coughs> since we're there, actually, we're seeing... <coughs> <coughs> and then since we're there, actually we're seeing now AI being able to create decent functional code, right? So that's another way of, of augmenting um, the capability of, of engineering. And I think, you know, that gives us the possibility of reducing engineering workforces to true hardcore engineers who can actually contribute in an engineering ish way right to 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 solving the problem and and to the business right rather than having to throw bodies at, at the problem so helping you know organizations focus much more on, on quality rather than quantity and um you know other than that we're, we're just doomed in, into this uh you know kind of self-colliding imploding uh ponzi scheme right yeah i mean you really did paint a house of cards which have diminishing returns over time which are calling upon this radical solution such as integrating low code and full code together such as automation or at least reducing redundant tasks so that engineers can focus on the high value activities i think moving away from the brute forces as you said and then using things such as ai so What's next uh, for FlowX.a? What's next for the platform? What can we expect uh, in 2023? What are some of the things you're most excited about, about what's going to happen on the platform and how we can actually start addressing this problem you've talked about? Well, you know, we, we already at the core of, of the platform, we had these these concepts, right? The, the hybrid, no code, full code, the um, um, AI, the generative AI for, for user interfaces and um, you know, encapsulating 
the, the non-functional characteristics and letting people just build functional things and then providing, you know, a, a layer of, of scalability and robustness for, for what people build. Uh, I think 2023 for us is, is super, super exciting because we're starting to bring out um, actually uh, machine learning and AI assisted development. Right and AI-assisted operations. So uh, we, uh, you know, we have been running for the past two years with with some very large banks, and now we finally gathered enough data to actually start producing uh, not just good but really great results in terms of being able to provide assistance to people building building software, right? But also uh, assistance to people running processes and trying to optimize processes, right? So things like AI-driven process optimization, um, AI-assisted development of, of interfaces, AI-assisted development of business rules, these are all coming and, uh, you know, we're, we're going to announce uh, uh, a, a couple of releases, I think, in uh, Q2, Q3 that are going to be very, very exciting for, uh, I would say, for the entire community. That's great. That's great. So it really sounds like in understanding the problem, we've got this house of cards in the way software has been built. Mm -hmm. And you're taking a few key concepts, this hybrid approach, this uh streamlining automation of basic tasks so people can move up to higher order functional feature driven product driven new releases and being as smart as possible to deploy ai to assist in that so we get more leverage in this game we can move away from brute force and go into being smarter not working harder and actually creating more value for all those constituents because i it sounds to me like the cto is happier his internal stakeholders are happier. His engineers are happier. And you know what? If they're all doing well, it sounds like the customer wins too. Yeah, abso absolutely. And I think, again, what we're benefiting from here is being able to leverage technology and, and software, which has this very interesting characteristic of, of having incredibly disproportionate results, right? Like orders of magnitude better results than, than you know, approaching things in kind of the brute force way and uh, i think yeah i think that's that's the the opportunity for for you know our civilization to to do things you know in in a way that's that's not just you know a bit better but it, that is orders of magnitude better going forward well i can't wait to have you back again um I, it would be great if we can put some time in the calendar around q2 q3 so we can talk about how the platform is really delivering on solving this problem and sort of unfolding this house of cards so that all of those stakeholders we talked about so they can actually do better uh, in their work or you know if they're actually on the other end if they're a customer of these financial institutions they can be happy customers loyal customers and customers that really see that value in that service provision right yeah absolutely and and you know i mean imagine if as a civilization we were able to build software and technology you know 10 times faster what that would mean right uh, there, there's a lot of people excited about curing cancer. Imagine if, in, you know, maybe we're 20 years away. Imagine we would be 20, you know, 10 times more efficient that that, that cure would be two years away instead of 20 or just five times, right? It's, it's four years away. There's people excited about going to Mars, right? All of that is, is powered by software. Imagine we get, you know, 10 times or five times better than, than, uh, than we are today at building software. What's what's the impact that we have on civilization? When instead of again something that's maybe 10, 20 years away, we could have something that's one or two years away. Mm -hmm. uh, and and mm -hmm. you know, so there's really this interesting transformational opportunity that that we have for for humankind as we launch into a new era with with better software with technology that's better, you know, and, and more robust and, and reliable in, instead of, you know, just the current uh, house of cards, if you, as you call it. Yeah. Well, Iwan, listen, thank you so much for 
really um, being so frank and open about an industry that you've been in your entire career and calling it to account and challenging the status quo and saying we can do better. It's, it's great to be part of it. It's great to hear how you and the team are thinking about it. I certainly can't wait to, to have you back to hear about some of these future releases. So I want to say a big thanks to you and a big thanks to you, all of our listeners and viewers. If you're interested in catching up on the transcript and the show notes and the links to what Ewan was talking about, head over to unbounded.flowex.ai. Okay, that's a wrap.